church. I'm going to need your help this morning. Help sing along with me. Are you awake and ready to sing? I'm sure these are songs that you know, but we have the words up there just in case. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this song. I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Ah, yes, you know it. I'm so glad I'm a part of the
in this world they can never be held in our hands I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary I'll believe whatever I believe that the Christ that was slain on that cross has the power to change lives today. For he changed me completely, a new life is mine, that is why by the cross I will stay. I Would you sing it loud to the Lord because he lived? Because he lived, I can face tomorrow. Because he lived, all fear, all fear is Give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Good morning. Welcome to Coburn United Methodist Church, and we are so glad that you are here. Later today, it is family night. We are all part of God's family, which means you are all invited. That is at 5 o'clock tonight. Other items in the bulletin would be the pastor's cooking class tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. There's a sign-up list at the Welcome Center. Um, there's a gold old gospel music night at the Senior Citizen Center downtown. If anybody's interested in attending that, that's on Thursday, February the 9th. We're looking forward to the Ash Wednesday service on February the 22nd. There will be two services that day, one at 11 and one at 7. 
If you are willing to donate altar flowers, please let Ruth Weekly know that. Any other announcement? I think you can read in the bulletin, except this you can't read in the bulletin because it's not in there. If you read your bulletin to get the hymn numbers, you will be singing Away in a Manger. <laughs> Instead, perhaps you would want to turn to 117 and 121. Now, if you will join me in our breakthrough prayer. Faithful God, empower us, inspire us, use us. Break through in our lives so that your vision becomes our reality. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it as we continue in an attitude of worship. Good morning. It is a joy to welcome everyone as we have gathered together in this space, indeed in our own spaces around the world, as Christ has gathered us together to worship our Lord and Savior. The invitation, as always, is there to slow ourselves down, to still ourselves as we are able to be open to the presence of God, Christ, and Spirit in our midst and in our own spaces. Would you stand as you are able for our opening prayer? God of mystery and of judgment, who has made us to be salt and light in a tasteless, shadowed world, guide us in this time of worship. Grant us understanding and spiritual discernment so that others may see your good works through us. Give you the glory and be moved to serve you. For this we pray it in through your Son's most holy name. Amen. 
our opening hymns, O God, our hope in ages past, and guide me, thou great Jehovah, are reminders to us of God's faithfulness and past and to keep God's promises and our ability to trust in the guidance of God as we move into the future. So let us join together in these two hymns. be seated as children come forward. You comfortable? Okay, that's good. All right. Well, we've got who are going through illness and some other things and can't be here with us today. Give thanks for those that we do have. Who are here? Am I cutting out? Well, where's my microphone? Where where'd it go? There. When you wear a black robe with a black microphone, you have no idea where things are. We'll try that for right now, see how that does. So, what does it mean to trust? They'll be by your side. Okay, what else does it mean? What do you think trusting someone means? It means they have to do what you say. They have to do what you say, okay? Not always. They'll always have a mind of their own. Okay, what else does trust mean? Anything else that trust means? Does trust always going to do everything for me? No. So if I trust somebody, does that mean that they're going to know exactly what to say all the time? No. Okay, does that mean if I trust somebody that they are going to guide me and help me and keep me safe? Sometimes, right? Means I'm right. So who do you trust? God, well, you just went straight to the end of this message, okay? <laughs> Let's think about people who are here now. Not that God's not with us now. Who do you trust? Parents. Parents thank you, okay. Grandparents. Is that it? Family. Friends. Who do you trust? Your, okay, your grandparents and parents, right? Do you trust people sitting in front of you? And your papa, do you trust people? Do you trust people sitting in front of you? That's not very confident. Do you trust the people sitting behind you? Yeah, right. Now, guys, sometimes it's hard because you don't necessarily know them, right? 
It's hard to trust people we don't know. But everybody here is pretty much here to help and guide, right? Okay. So now, you already gave me the big answer. Who is it that we're supposed to trust? God. God. Why do we trust God? Because he made us. And what else? Does he guide us? Does he love us? And he built us? And he wants us to do things? Do we trust Jesus? Why do we trust Jesus? Because Jesus is for us and Jesus guides us and calls us? Do we trust the Holy Spirit? Why do we trust the Holy Spirit? It, it, okay, it helps lead us and guide us, right? Okay, so we trust God because God made us. We trust, well, we don't, we, we got to be careful who we trust sometimes, right? Sometimes we have to be careful who we trust because sometimes people aren't there to always do good. But we trust God and we trust Christ, we trust Spirit because three and one are there to help us, okay? So if you trust Jesus and you trust God and Spirit, they're going to guide you, they're going to lead you, they're going to help you, right? Okay, so can you do that? Can you trust them? Can you trust God? I didn't hear a yes. Can you trust God? Yes. Can you trust Jesus? Yes. Can you trust the Spirit? Yes. Do it. Do it. Okay. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us, for guiding us, for caring for us. Help us to trust you and to share others about you. Amen. All right, you are good to go. Go, they do. As we come now to a time of sharing in our, our tithes and our offerings of giving back to God, we are reminded of the blessings that God gives in our life. In our first hymns, we sing of God's blessings before us, of the promises that God has fulfilled, and the hope that we have in following God who guides us. And so our giving is in response to that, that we give as an investment into the kingdom, as we give to a God who gives so freely. So as the ushers come forward, let us give joyfully back to God.
poured out in our lives. And in return, we give back a portion of that. We pray that you would receive it, that you would bless it, that you would use it to further your kingdom, that all might come to know your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. For it is in his holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we come now to a time of sharing our joys and our concerns with one another, lifting up and praying those things that rest in our hearts and our minds, there are many, many to keep in prayer in this time, not forgetting those listed in the bulletin and the different needs and situations there, but praying for those who grieve and mourn loss in this time, for those who move through different emotions, for those waiting test results, for those moving through procedures, there are many that we hold in prayer. Those dealing with tragedy and devastation, both of human cause and natural, there are many around the world who are going through all sorts of different things. And I would wonder how many of us have silent prayer to lift up today. Yes, it would seem that there is an unending supply of prayer for us to lift up, for that which we speak out loud, and that which we hold on to ourselves. But we know and worship a God who knows and hears all of our prayers. Those that we choose to turn over and those that we hold to ourselves. And, and there's a question for us today. It's going to come up on the slide in just a minute here. But is the prayer that we say with our lips the prayer of our life? Is what we speak out loud, whether actually moving our lips or speaking in our heart and our mind, really the prayer of our life? Or is it just something to get us through? Because often we are guilty of just saying something to move on to the next. But God desires conversation. God desires relationship. And we do that in and through prayer. So today we will sing, we'll pray, we'll sing, we'll pray, we'll move back and forth. And I, my prayer is that we would feel the Spirit in this moment. Let us join together. And Father, we love you. We, we praise you, we worship you, we adore you. But you, God, know more. You know that we often glorify other things, that we often praise other things, that we often lift up things other than you. So in this moment, oh God, as we come to you in prayer, would you take those things from us, those things that, that hinder us from truly glorifying you, those things that, that truly hold us from worshiping you. Take the hurt, take the pain, take the wandering, take the darkness. Take the things that we have lifted up that deserve not to be lifted up. That we might be focused on you and you alone. On your movement in our life. On your call in our life. On your presence in our life. We give you glory. We give you praise. Not because you demand it, but because you deserve it. Because you promised, Lord, to go to be with us, to be with us always, and to send the one who would save us, the one who would restore us, the one who would renew us, the one with us even now, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who calls us, who claims us. Let us raise our voices and our love for Christ.
Jesus, you did not come to this world to be comfortable and make us comfortable. You did not come to this place to, to walk the streets and fit in. You did not live and breathe among us to just be as everybody else. You came to change. You came to shake up. You came to transform. You came to break the bonds. You came to do the new thing. You went to the cross willingly to die for our sins, for our forgiveness. You rose to new life so that we might be in new life. We know this, Christ, and yet often we live otherwise. We live as though we can do as we wish, as we please, to say as we do, as we wish, as we please, forgetting the sacrifice that you made so that we might be here today, forgetting what you have done for us. Shake us up, Christ. Shake us off our feet. Shake us up. Renew us. Transform us. Open our minds. Open our ears. Move away the cross from the seal from our eyes. Soften our heart that we might see you, that we might know you, that we might believe in you, that we might share others about you, that we are your people, that we are your children, O oh Christ. You said the day would come when peace would be known, when the Spirit would be poured out on us. And we pray to know that this day, as we sing, we love you, Spirit. Spirit, we love you. We worship you. heaviness on your people oh God there is a heaviness on your creation a heaviness on your world pour out your Holy Spirit hold nothing back that it would blow among all of creation that it would pour out among all people that we would hear new that we would feel new that we would be awakened new to hear your voice and not the others to hear your call and not the others, to be moved into your will and not ours. Make your spirit move among us, God. Lift us up, move us out, shake us, renew us, transform us. When we hurt, we know you give grace. When we have sinned, we know you forgive. May your spirit remind us of those things. Yes, oh God, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we pray to you now. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We give you all the thanks that you so rightly deserve. Be with us in this moment. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for we lift these things up. We lift these prayers up. We speak these things in that most holy, that most special, that most precious name of Christ our Savior, your Son sent among us as he calls out to us, as he teaches us, as he leads us to say not in hurried tones, to say not in rushed ways, but to say with confidence, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm reading from Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 58, verses 1 through 12. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout out loud. Don't be timid. Tell my people, Israel, of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation. They would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why, I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourself with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives that need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here, he will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. Our second reading comes from the first Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter 2, the verse, first 12 verses. Listen again for the word of God. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters... I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. 
For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. And my message and my preaching were very plain, rather than using clever and persuasive speeches. I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Yet when I am among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would have not crucified our glorious Lord. This is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit. For his Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. May God add his blessing to this, the reading of his holy word. Amen. God of our days and our nights, of our coming and our going, bless the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts that by them and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would be made more fitting servants of your most holy will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had the situation, a moment maybe, in the midst of conversation, where you knew exactly what needed to be said? You had everything worked out, all the words. You knew exactly what everyone else needed to hear. All of the words were there, but you open your mouth and nothing comes out. Has that happened to anybody? I think we've all had that happen at some point in time. When you just know, you know exactly what they need to hear. You know exactly what needs to be said. But for whatever reason, you open your mouth and nothing comes out. But what about opposite of that? You've got all the words and you're desperately trying to hold them in because you know if they come out, something's going to come out that you regret or something's going to come out that's going to hurt and you open your mouth and it's like a river flooding the banks. Everything just pours out and you can't take them all back. We have both of those moments. Well, what about this? You may know someone or you may have been this person who seems to have all of the words necessary You know exactly what needs to be said. There's an argument for everything, even if others don't want to hear it. They seem to speak with wisdom and persuasion, unlike any other, at least they think they do. Not always a know-it-all, but someone who seems to know everything. We have those people in our lives, don't we? And sometimes we are those people who think that we know everything, that we know exactly what everyone needs to hear, and we have no trouble keeping it out and letting it out. In fact, we have trouble keeping it in. See, there's another group here, though. We talked about those who open their mouths and nothing comes out. We talked about those who everything pours out and those who know it all. But there's another group, those who, who have things about them that they find hard to explain, Feelings so personal and private, experiences so intimate that no one else knows about them, vulnerabilities that they are not willing to share, experiences that need not be made known, news and realities that they don't want anyone to know about. I mean, they know these things. They're they're in their head. But to let these words out would be to accept vulnerability. And that's just too far for some to go. Well, how many of us go back and forth among these realities, knowing everything one minute, at least thinking you know everything, knowing nothing the next minute, and having some things that we have no way of sharing. How many, because of this moving around, get to a point where you feel that you can only rely on yourself, that you can only rely on, on your own knowledge, on your own wisdom, Rely on what you can control and what you believe. How many of us live in that space, the space in the middle of these realities? But there's another way, isn't there? 
There's another way for us to live. Remember what the Corinthians passage opens up with. When I first came to you, this is one of my favorite passages, the first five verses of this. When I first came to you, I did not use lofty words or impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching was very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Who here is willing to admit with such truth that that is your intention? That you come not to be heard yourself, that you speak not to have your own wisdom known, but that you, whatever you say, would lead, guide others to God that it would be the Holy Spirit covering you and speaking through you. I mean, Paul is speaking here with a deep emotion. He loves the people in Corinth. He's laying it all out for those then and for us today. And think about it. Paul's the one who has an argument for everything. He can argue with the best of them. He, he, the one who has laid his life out bare for all to know and see. The one who can argue with anybody. The one who has all of their credentials. He's from the right place, from the right clan. He's been educated well. He's lived well. He's done everything right. All of the education, all of the understanding. Here is Paul saying that all he has, that all he knows, that all he desires to know is Jesus Christ. The way of Jesus, the love of Jesus, nothing but Christ. He's not relying on his own knowledge or his own ability. He could be and often was the wisest and most persuasive one of all. But he's not relying on his own self. He's relying on God and Christ alone. See, he's come to realize that if it were left up to humanity... If it were left up to any of those in his time, our time, any time, if it were left up even to him, nothing would ever go right. Everyone would fall down and fall down hard with nothing and no one to pick them up. Paul knows this because of his experience on the road to Damascus when he was the one persecuting, when he was the one hurting, when he was the one pointing fingers and blaming and accusing and wanting nothing to do with Christ because Christ was this crazy guy who ran around saying these weird things, claiming to be of God. Paul saw at that point, he, that's what he was doing. And until he's on the road to Damascus and the light knocks him down and he hears that voice, now all of a sudden everything that was before is nothing because of what he has now in Christ. You see, Paul is saying here, I did not come with my own words. I don't have all the answers. I haven't spoken with some great wisdom thought of my own. I've not used persuasive words for my gain. No, all that I do, all that I say, all that I am is because of Jesus Christ and what Christ has done for me. I made mistakes. I messed up. I fell down. Others have accused me. Others have pushed me. Others have knocked me down. But Christ still has done these things for me. All because of his love for me. And this is what I desire for you, that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power, on the power of the Spirit. See, Paul did not gain all of this understanding from a bunch of rules, though he knew what the rules were. He didn't learn of God's great salvation and love through his education, though that did help occasionally. Paul learned of God's salvation through the message of Jesus Christ and Christ crucified and Christ risen. It wasn't and isn't a message filled with wise and persuasive words that gave Paul insight into God's great wisdom. It was the demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power, a power that overcame him, a power that moved through him, a power that though he may have fought it when he relinquished his control, his world, his very being, he was a wholly different person. And the same is there for us. But did you hear what Paul had to do? He had to give up control. He had to give up the desire to run everything in his life and say, yes, God, I will let you do what you're going to do, even if it might hurt, even if it might not make sense, even if it means I might have to be uncomfortable. I will let your spirit overcome me. You remember what Paul says. 
We've received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. Do you understand this? Do you understand what God has freely given you? Do you understand what it means that Jesus Christ gave his life in order to save your soul? That Christ did what he did so that you might be here today. That Christ is what he is so that you might know something different. Do you understand that it is by grace you are saved through faith? Do you understand that this is salvation is a gift of God freely given and there is nothing, there is not anything you can do to deserve it. There's nothing you can do to get it. And there's nothing you can do to lose it. Do you understand that God has saved you because God loves you and has great plans for your life? I mean, mean, do you know this? Do you believe this? Because no amount of human wisdom, not any degree of our own understanding, not all the persuasion in the world can possibly do for us what God has already done for us and then through Jesus Christ. And we can gain this understanding an understanding of nothing but Jesus Christ. When we do that, everything changes. When our focus is not on the things of the world, but on Christ, when our focus is not on that which we think is important but will fleet away in fleeting moments, but only on Christ, when we focus not on the power and the prestige and the wealth and and the fame and everything else that can come in this world, when we focus not on the hurt and the pain and all of that and the pointing fingers and everything else, but when we focus only on Christ, everything changes. We become the very ones God has called us to be. We begin to live into all that God has called us to live into. We begin ever so slowly to let go of our control when we give it all over to God. See, Paul did not give up all that he had known. He did not give up all that he had learned. He did not forget all of those who had taught him and influenced him. There were far too many to forget them. But he did not give these things up to know Christ. Those things are are still there. He remembers them but his focus is on Christ. And the same should be true for us. But if anything didn't line up with Jesus Christ and what he taught, if an argument or a debate or a thought or a deed did not sit well with the example Jesus Christ gives, an example of love, an example of grace, an example of mercy, an example of forgiveness, then it was nothing in Paul's eyes. And the same is true for us today. If we hear something that does not line up with Christ, if we hear something that focuses on division rather than unity, if we hear something that tells to hate instead of love, if we hear something that says to push out instead of welcome in, it doesn't line up with Christ, and we should push that away. If it does not line up with Christ and what Christ did, what Christ said, what Christ taught, then it is nothing. And how easy is this for us to do, though? How easy is it? For us to examine our lives, to examine our understanding, to examine our thoughts that maybe, maybe we might have to change. How easy is it for us to to give up things, to give up control, to let God have it all and to do as God wishes to do? I mean, is it easy? No, it's not, is it? It's a hard thing to do to give up control. It's a hard thing to do to let God have it because then God might just know my vulnerabilities. God might just know what I've done. God might just know what I'm thinking right now. God might just know what I have said in the past, but here's the thing, guess what? God already knows. God already knows those things and God has said I wiped those things clean because of my son, your Savior Christ. I know what you said. I know what you've done. I know how you've been. And I know what others have said about you, but that doesn't matter because I love you in and through Christ. So we have to give up the control. We have to give up the holding back. It's what we're called to do. If anything in our lives does not line up with Christ and his ways and his love, then we have to make some serious evaluations if we are only just going through the motions, if we are only doing things to look a certain way or to appeal to a certain audience, if we are doing things just for our own benefit or for a benefit of the few who might line up with us, 
all the while forgetting about all that is going on around us, then we have some serious evaluating to do. I mean, remember, remember the words of Isaiah. Those words we heard in that 58th chapter. These are not words that are always quoted. This is not a section of Isaiah that is, that is freely spoken. You know why? Because it's a challenge. It's a challenge when we read what God really, truly desires. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from your relatives who need help. Does this sound familiar? Guess what Jesus says 800 years later? Give clothes to those who need them. Feed those who are hungry. Do not turn your neighbor away. Free the oppressed. Help those in need. Jesus says these same things. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. But God's not done. He says that the Lord will answer, yes, I'm here. But remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. I mean, God is very pointed here. If you really worship me, if you really believe in me, don't just come and give me empty words. Don't just come and give me an empty prayer. Don't just say the things. Do them. Care for others. Love others. Free others. Help others. Be with others. Do for them what I have done for you in and through Christ. This is what God desires of us. This is what God commands us to do. This is the example Christ gives. It's not easy to do, I know. None of these things come naturally. I mean, who here naturally, free willingly, gives up the coat off your back to help your neighbor? This isn't, you know, this is a kind of Jesus moment. Who opens your door to the stranger? Who gives your last bit of food to those in need? I, I, you know, my, my, I don't lift my father up very much. My dad, I think I've shared with you before, he's not a church person. He grew up the son of a Nazarene deacon, and his mother played the piano at the church, so you guess where he was every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday without any choice, and so he's got a bad taste in his mouth of that. But he learned some things, and he picked up some things. Growing up, we were not rich. We were poor, but we didn't know we were poor. Y'all know what that means, right? We had no idea that we were not making it because we always had food on the table and clothes on our back. But every day, there was a family down the street who they had four or five kids. They, everybody knew they were poor. Everybody knew they were going without. Everybody knew they were struggling. But every morning for about a month, a bag of groceries showed up on their front step. Nobody knew where it came from. But well, one, more, one morning, I say morning, it's three in the morning, I hear a noise, and I go downstairs, and I see my dad rummaging through our pantry, a pantry that does not have filled shelves. And he's taking cans, and he's taking items off of those shelves, putting them in a bag, and taking them down to this house at three in the morning so that no one would see him, so that no one would know what he's doing but he heard something when he was in church. He heard something from the deacon who talked to him. He heard something from his mother that said that even if you've got nothing, you're still supposed to help your neighbor. That even if you yourself are struggling, it doesn't get you out of helping those around you. We are called to do these things together. See, I don't know about you, but these are not easy things to do. There are times when I would rather worry about myself focusing only on me, but I know that this is not what God wants me to do. I know that there are times when I look judgmentally on others. There are times when I look to others and think things I ought not think. There are times when I look for the most persuasive argument, when I try to have the wisest and the most educated words, but here's the thing. If what I do and what I say is not focused on Christ, if my intention is not to share Christ, if my point is not to witness to Christ, to be an example to Christ, then I've missed something wholly and completely. 
If I allow my wisdom to get in the way, whatever I perceive to have, then I have no idea at all of what God has is and will do for me in this world, nor what God will do for any of us. Paul says to the Corinthians, indeed to us today, that when it came to him, to when he came to them, he did not use lofty words and impressive wisdom. He chose to forget all of that and focus only on Christ, to forget everything except Christ. See, Paul's focus was on Christ and Christ alone. His intention, his purpose was to share Christ and Christ alone. He knew Christ. Christ was everything to him. So who is Christ to us? Who is Christ to you? Who is Christ to me? See, I said it in the prayer, but Christ to me is one who came not to make me comfortable. Christ is one who came to me not to say everything's fine, just keep going about your business. Christ is not one who came and says that the world is fine as it is. No, Christ is the one who came and turned everything upside down, not just a table and a temple. Christ is the one who said, yes, this is how you have heard the law read, but this is what it really means. Christ is the one who came and said that God says to do these things. I'm just repeating it to you. Do it. Help others, care for others, love others, share with others. Christ is the one who looks at me and says, though you have fallen, though you have sinned, though others have pointed at you and cursed at you and yelled at you, I'm still going to pick you up. I'm still going to hold you. I'm still going to carry you on. But the day comes when you got to step on your own and do these very things. If we as those who follow Christ try and emulate the world's understanding of power, if we try and be and do everything that the world says is important, then we will cease to be the people God has called us to be. The wisdom of God is not discerned through the wisdom of humanity. The wisdom of God is discerned through the spirit of God And it involves the self-emptying humility of God, a humility born of love, a love made known most clearly in and through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we become empowered by this humble love, a love that fills us and guides us, when we lean on and into nothing but Christ, then we not only become who we were created to be, but we are also empowered to become a people, a church, who bring healing and new life to a community and a world that desperately needs it. When we do these things, our light begins to shine brighter and brighter, not our light, but God's light in us. Whatever our realities might be, wherever we find ourselves, we know that we can lean on Christ and to move through that reality. So may we be more aware of God's spirit and the power that is there. May we be more and more focused on Christ and the love he freely gives. May we live into who and what God has called us to be, those who are willing to go out those who are willing to fight injustice and set the oppressed free to do the things that God, that Christ commands us to do, those who are willing to shout out and not hold back, those who are willing to do these very things. May our focus, may our intention, may our purpose be nothing but Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we come to the table. Not our table. Not Coburn's table, not a United Methodist table, not at any of our table, but God's table, set and prepared by the very hands of Christ, the one who gathers us in as he gathered those disciples together so long ago, who calls us in to share in this meal, to share in this forgiveness. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity 
made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and in our own spaces and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I want to invite those who will be assisting to come forward. Today we will move forward as we have did the last time we were gathered together. So the ushers will instruct you and guide you. We will come up the side aisles and then return down the center aisles. So as the ushers invite, the table has been set. All are welcome and invited to come forward.
forgiven for you. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks in this time for this act of love, of grace, of mercy that you have so freely poured out over us, given to us, and in through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray to know his presence, to give thanks for this act, and to carry this with us as we go into the world to share others, to share with others that this is freely given and available for all. And in through your Son's most holy name we pray. Amen. So sometimes we do these things and we live into what God has called us to live into and it gets to be just a little difficult. It gets to be just a little hard. Life happens. Things happen. The the darkness creeps in. The light seems to fade away and we're not sure where to go. But we know that there is one who calls out to us and says, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. The light is still there. The darkness shall fade away and all new shall be known. Everything will be okay. It will be well. So our final hymn, It is Well with My Soul. The invitation is to sing that as though we believe it, as though we know it to be true and we want others to hear it as well. So let us stand as we are able and raise our voices with It is Well. again.
beloved children of God, may you know that it, it, it will be well. That though life may happen, it will be well if your focus is on Christ. Know Christ. Love Christ. Share Christ with all in the world. Hold nothing back, but know nothing but Christ. Go and be the church. Amen.